one of the things that we do is we make sure that that the costs um, and uses of funds that don't necessarily count as real estate replacement, that we fund those with cash. We fund those with new cash um, so that it doesn't create the capital gains headache, headache for somebody who thinks they've done a perfect exchange. What's been your biggest frustration with, with the 1031? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I'd say, you know, really, we don't have any, we don't have any real complaints. Um, I mean, there are certainly a lot of details that you have to follow and follow very closely um, to make sure that your that your that your exchange is gonna is gonna qualify uh, and that it would stand up to an audit if you if you got audited. Um, so, I mean, there's a fair amount of particulars that are involved, um, and also from time to time we'll do an exchange. Um, you know, any one acquisition that we acquire through an exchange might include two or three or four of our own partnerships and then, you know, four to six um, tenant common investors who are, who are clients of ours who have their own exchange that they want to complete. So, you know, we may have anywhere from, it's usually going to be five to 10. Sometimes, sometimes we can get more, but it's usually going to be five to 10 investors on the, on, on the title. And, and there's, a, you know, there's a fair amount of heavy lifting and, and brain surgery uh, that's involved to get that done and get it snapped in place uh, uh, and, and, and and just close, right? And to close knowing that you've dotted all your I's and crossed your T's. I would say that for for garden variety investors, maybe even for experienced, sophisticated investors, the aspect of, of the exchange um, that has to be looked at very closely aside from just getting, you know, make, making sure it qualifies in terms of the date of designation and the date of the acquisition and debt replacement and equity replacement and all that. You, you have to be very mindful of um, other costs that are being paid that don't count as real estate replacement, right? If it's certain fees um, might not count as real estate replacement. Reserve, uh, funding a reserve at the property does not count as a real estate replacement. Uh, CapEx, if you if you build a treasury uh, to do CapEx at the property, that's not gonna count as real estate replacement. And so you could, you could tell yourself you've done the perfect exchange and still have boot, still have capital, capital gain exposed from it. And so one of the things that we do is we make sure that that the costs um, and uses of funds that don't necessarily count as real estate replacement, that we fund those with cash. We fund those with new cash um, so that it doesn't create the capital gains headache, headache for somebody who thinks they've done a perfect exchange. Yeah, so, so okay, the, the expenses that aren't basically related to real estate, people aren't aren't accounting for them. And then once they've done their exchange, it comes back and it's like, Hey, now nah, you're going to owe for this number that you guys didn't account for. Sure. So let's just pretend, let's just pretend that it's a, it's a $10 million asset and, and you've got something that, that you're going to do a value add um, strategy on. You're going to do a lot of work inside and outside um, the apartments, you know, common areas, roofs, fitness center, clubhouse, parking lots, landscaping, unit interiors, et cetera. And, and let's just also assume that you decide to fund a reserve uh, for operation. Um, and then you, have, you know, then you have some other costs, some other fees that, that might not count as real estate replacement, whether it's your, you know, your legal fees for your attorneys, um, title and escrow, loan points, whatever, whatever else it is. And let's assume that all those costs come up to Two million bucks. Um, that sounds like a lot, but let's not forget that you're that you're kind of putting together a million to a million and a half war chest for capex and then reserves and some other things, yeah. right? And so you've sold you've sold the property, um, and, and let's say your lender is going to give you fifty percent against total cost, right? So you're going to get a loan for six million bucks and you're going to fund six million in equity. Um, and let's say that that fits perfectly uh, with your exchange that you've sold a property, you made $12 million net, you had a $6 million loan, you got 6 million in cash and in it goes, right? You complete your exchange. 
Well, everyone's going to say, great, you did a terrific job. You completed your exchange, but you have $2 million of capital gain here because all this other stuff that you funded is not real estate. It's reserves, it's CapEx, it's fees, it's what have you. And so we, we every time, uh, get very far down in the weeds and look at the costs that we're going to have that, that we know will not qualify as real estate replacement. And we fund those with cash. And so if you're, you know, if you're an exchange investor and you're in that scenario, um, you know, you sold a $12 million deal and you bought this other thing. You just need to know, you, you need to have your eyes on um, the, the, the parts of the execution that aren't going to be helpful for your exchange because you, in, the, in, in that scenario, you would have some capital gains tax. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people do miss that and, and then they get, you know, slapped with, with it and they're like, yeah, and they're surprised. Yeah. I mean, the exchange accommodator is going to do his or her best to make sure your papers are in order and to make sure that you've designated appropriately within the 45 days and that you've closed on time and that your money moved and that you got new financing and all that. But your exchange accommodator is not going to get down in the weeds on other cost areas in your acquisition. And for that matter, your CPA might not either, unless you have a really good real estate CPA. Um, but you have to you have to look at you have to look at an exchange holistically and look at all of its parts, um, not just the simple well not simple, but not just the comparatively straightforward transaction parts. Yeah, absolutely, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we use a deferred sales trust. You know, uh, we love ten thirty ones right when they make sense and when you can find the right thing. But what's unique about the deferred sales trust is that you can you can sell an asset. It doesn't have to be real estate. It can be any asset, business, stock, commercial real estate, primary home, and, uh, you know, whatever, Bitcoin. And then you can go into any sort of asset you want. It's a, it's, it's not following the same rules as a 1031. It doesn't follow the time constraint laws. It doesn't, it doesn't have the like kind restrictions. So you can sell an asset, put it into super conservative investments, and then wait until that real estate deal pops pops up and then you can go and you can you can purchase that deal it's kind of like your ability to different to codes and all that but for conceptual purposes it's kind of like 1031ing into a self-directed ira account that you can use to go out and invest in in whatever you want and what's great about it too is that it um it it allows you to uh break up syndications too so you know if you got you know 10 of your investors and and only you know, and three or four of them don't want to, don't want to go. Well, if, if you're not buying those guys out or, or, you know, doing something else, right. You're, you're basically, you know, your 1031 is kind of dead. Well, in this, in this case, you can basically uh, use the, each individual person can use their own deferred sales trust and, and not have to pay the capital gains tax. And the ones who want to can just take their money and they can go. So it, it gives you complete flexibility to, control the timing, the asset, um, you know, uh, what asset you go into the investment, um, when and, and, and where, and it's, it gives ca like cash flow and diversification. It's a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal tool. It also moves assets outside the taxable state. And so you're not, you know, your heirs aren't subject to that 40% death tax when you are liquidating those assets. And so that's a whole nother conversation, but, yeah. um, you're yeah. gonna have a pretty. You're gonna have a pretty big estate if you're paying any any estate to, any inheritance tax. Yeah, you got to have over twenty. It's like twenty two uh, million something. Twenty five million. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's it's definitely up there. But those those people do. You know. Sure. I'm, of course. I imagine you'll be up there. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe. If I don't maybe. give it all away first. Yeah.